Gary, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, as we can clearly tell, it is the morning after the party, if you look around the room. Um, also, partially why we're running a little late, um, that was, I think, mostly because I just lost track of time. Um, so uh, this morning we're going to feature uh, kind of some of the work that's been going on over the summer, uh, mostly at Red Hat. Uh, we kind of uh, thought this might be a fun idea, uh, primarily because I don't know about all of you, but is a kind of professional software developer. Uh, it's really interesting to see what's what's kind of going on in in research and academia, um, and so we thought we could highlight some of that. We thought it'd be interesting, um, and uh, kind of moving on from there. After that, we're we're going to go through and vote on the lightning talks and figure out which one you want to see. Um, and then we're going to have that person come up and give the lightning talk. Uh, to make it more complicated and awkward, if you are doing a lightning talk, could you please email me a link to your talk so that I can put it up, put up your slides, assuming you have slides. So I am Langdon at redhat.com. So that's L-A-N-G-D-O-N. Uh, and uh, just if you're planning on doing a lightning talk, just send me a link and then I'll pull it up on this computer so we don't have to like swap computers. And hopefully this doesn't go terribly, but I thought it'd be fun. Um, all right, so getting started. Oh, sorry, uh, I meant to cover a couple more logistics. Um, obviously, this is the last day of the conference. Um, at the end of the conference, we will have a closing event in the same room where we usually do trivia about the conference, um, and there will be awesome prizes. So don't, you know, le learn everything there is to know about the conference, and then when you come, uh, you'll be able to, uh, you know, win the fabulous prizes. Uh, usually it is a significant amount of swag, and when I say significant, I mean significant. Um, so that's, uh, that'll be, I can't remember exactly the time, but I want to say it's like 3 o'clock, um, but basically it's at, after the end of the sessions. Um, I hope everyone's been having a good time. Uh, please let us know if there's anything we can change. Um, and there's a very good chance that I'll say, hey, maybe that's a good idea for next year. Um, but definitely let us know and we'll pretend like we care. Um, Sorry, no, we really do care, uh, and uh, we really hope you're having a good time, uh, and uh, I think it's been going pretty well. So, without further ado, um, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so first one, this is, and because it's intern programs, everybody's got to have like their own like special acronym, so uh, I may be struggling with some of these, uh, you know, I apologize in advance, uh, but this one is the Greater Boston Area Research Opportunities for Young Women aka GROW, um, which is a really cool high school program uh, for, um, you know, obviously women. Um, and I actually had the pleasure of uh, working with uh, Nazari here on the, on the left, who was one of my interns. Um, and all three of these women were kind of sitting at Boston University uh, and cranking through on really interesting uh, stuff, doing um, uh, essentially machine learning with AI and Python. Um, and eating all of the snacks, like like all the snacks. It was m impressive. Um, but as you can see, they actually were able to put some posters together uh, that showed off uh, their results. Um, and uh, these two were actually working together, so they were the right two in the last photo. Um, I don't know what I have for my next, yeah. So uh, what they did was they were actually looking at uh, comments on pull requests um, and analyzing the sentiment of them and like giving them like a hostility measure and all this stuff, it was, it was really quite interesting. So uh, if, you, if you haven't seen it, you should try to check out that research. Um, and then we've actually been in a kind of a parallel program, actually been also expanding that research or, or kind of related research around uh, in general looking at how diversity works in GitHub and, and what happens, uh, which is both fascinating and frightening at the same time. Um, so this is Zari, and see, that's me over here. Um, and uh, she was working on um, a real software engineering problem, which I think gets pushed under the rug a lot, which is like, all right, we've got like a whole bunch of scripts and stuff that gotta run to make the, you know, like stats or whatever go. How are we gonna do that in some sort of automated way so that they actually run every, um, you know, X amount of time? Oh, and by the way, we have a bunch of non, uh, like, software engineers who are actually authoring these scripts, so we want to make sure they can update them, right, because they're data scientists or they're, uh, you know, or what we used to call quants. Um, 
So how do we let them update them on their own without calling me all the time to update their scripts and, and do the calculations? This is specifically around statistics um, in baseball. And uh, if you uh, watch the news, um, you, uh, you may have heard about this project um, and uh, you know, kind of watch this space for, for some bigger announcements about it in the next few months, which has uh, really been a lot of fun. Um, oh, sorry, we do have this one. I thought this was earlier. So again, basically the same project. They were essentially working together on kind of different aspects of uh, looking at, um, like I said, PRs on, on GitHub. Um, all right, then we have the ramp program at UMass Lowell. So I'm not as tightly integrated with this one. Um, and this is, let's see, Research, Academics, and Mentoring Pathways program. Uh, so this is a summer jumpstart program for incoming students, um, including women and racial and ethnic minority students, designed to help you design a pathway to successful graduation. All right, so um, I'm not sure, so one of the things we wanted to do was, um, are any of these students in the audience? Um, I'm pretty sure the three high schoolers I was just talking about were not here, so that's why I didn't mention it earlier. All right, so none of the ramp students are here either. Um, that's too bad. So um, here we have, um, sorry, basically a very large program, honestly. Um, and uh, Denise, who is here in the middle, um, was, a, was a big catalyst, in a sense, for it. Um, and she's the uh, VP of Engineering uh, her official title, I think, is VP Engineering Global. But really what that means is uh, she has, uh, she's the software engineering lead for all of Enterprise Linux, which is kind of amazing. And then, let's see, so moving on, uh, we have the SOAR CS program, which I am led to believe is um, meant to be a pun. Um, I will let you figure out what the pun is yourself. Um, and I think those students are here because I see shirts. Uh, so if they wanted to come up, come on, you can come up here. I, I take no responsibility for picture choices. All right. There you go. So what did you work on? Well, I personally worked on a virtual reality project on this platform called Meyer, which um, Dr. Fred's team created. And um, yeah, it's essentially just a world that you can see in virtual reality. And everything you code pops up in the world. Nice. And what did you work on? Okay, so I created a Saucius app for our group. It's something small, but I used um, a little bit of experience in Android programming. Nice. Yes. So, so was it a mobile application or web? Yeah, a mobile, mobile. application. Nice. Yes. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, yeah, you, you, know, you often need app, actually software to run these programs a lot of the time, and that usually gets uh, you know, what we refer to as uh, like short shrift, uh, and so everything ends up terribly. I can speak from experience for running this conference, all of our software is terrible, so. Okay. Hello. Um, so I use the microbit, which is a microcontroller, and it has a couple of LEDs on its surface, and I use that to make um, an infinite runner game which I call Jurassic Jump. It's <laughs> not, I, if you know the, that little Chrome game mm -hmm. in, um, yeah, the, the one with the dinosaur. My, my kids literally disconnect the internet to play it. <laughs> it's, it's an attempt at that on a five by five LED awesome. screen. Right. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so I used Meyer, uh, which is that virtual reality program, uh, to just craft an army of snowmen, um, you know, waving their arms, uh, pumping, getting ready for battle to take over the world. All right. Uh, so me and Kate made, using the uh, micro bits, uh, we just sort of had all these like sounds and uh, stuff and tones, since it does like single tones. So we tried to uh, um, work with both of them and the radio feature with it to make um, two uh, guitars that play simultaneously. 
um, and the song was Here Comes the Sun by the Beatles. <laughs> o- only like the first 30 seconds, though. It kind of, it would take too long to do the rest of it. Cool. Say anything about it? Most people can recognize Beatles song in the first 30 seconds. So. Yeah, I'm yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I also made a virtual reality thing with um, Meyer. I created like uh, a, a world with like, you know, trees and grass and then like thunderclouds to it too. Cool. Yep. I made a Pyth- I mean, I mean a Spotify controller using the micro bit and Python with Pi Serial on Spotify. And what does it do? Uh, you can search for songs, you can pause, and you can resume, and it'll tell you like exactly where you stopped in the song. Cool. Very nice. Hi everyone. So I'm Fred Martin. I'm the faculty member at UMass Lowell. I'm also associate dean for student success. Um, can we have a round of applause for our students who made all these projects and are here? I just. Very nice. Wait, Very wait, nice. I'm a ham. Before I give the, the mic back to Langdon, um, all the projects they just described are exhibit are on, on exhibit in the hall, so you can see them with the virtual reality goggles, you can hear the song. And I also, if I'd ask my students who created and ran the program, would you please stand up? So these are undergraduates at UMass Lowell. Thank you. All right, thanks so much. See, it's not that bad. It's, it's not too awkward. It's working. All right, so this is another program that I've actually been involved with. Um, it's just down the street. Um, and uh, we have, as many of you know, uh, we have this kind of what we call, I don't know who came up with this term, but a collaboratory, which is basically a, an integration with uh, Boston University and uh, Red Hat uh, to kind of feature um, a whole bunch of different projects. Um, So actually, before I move on to that, so um, a lot of those projects you might have seen talks about actually here. Um, You also, the Massachusetts Open Cloud is one of those projects. Uh, The CRIS project, uh, which is also a program for um, uh, kind of doing healthcare machine learning kind of work. Um, uh, And then a a bunch of other stuff as well. So this has been pretty cool. Uh, if you've seen any of these speakers, they were all PhD can- or they all are currently PhD candidates. Uh, we had a bunch of them uh, be able to speak, and uh, it's been pretty cool. And uh, that project over there is one of the ones I'm involved in, so I like it the best. Um, and uh, I'd like to point them out: Are there any of them here, or is it too early for PhD students? I, I think it's too early. Uh, so th- this is where we were most toss up on whether or not we would have people this early in the morning. Um, but you know, hey. Um, then we also have this global intern and co-op program. Um, so, like, we have these kind of centers around research, particularly in Boston. Also in Brno, which is actually a huge program. And if you don't know where Brno is, Brno is uh, basically the second biggest city in the Czech Republic. Uh, so nobody's ever heard of it. Um, but it's awesome, and I highly recommend going there. And it's very, very inexpensive. Uh, and then... Um, we also do a lot of this work in Tel Aviv as well, um, and I can't think of any of the school names. But so, long story short, we kind of have these like strong relationships with various universities, and uh, you know, we would love you all to be more involved in those. Um, and then, God, is that really fuzzy for you guys? Um, so. Sorry, I actually forgot the slide was here. So, uh, yeah, so huge program in, in Brno. Um, we had actually about, um, do we have, yeah. Um, so <clears throat> we also had another, like, what, what do we have, 50 in Boston downtown and then another 50 in Westford? Something like that? No. What? 56 in Boston, 35 in, in Westford. Um, and I don't think any of the ones, surprisingly, were actually gardeners in Westford. Um, so, but in Brno, like I said, we have a huge program as well as Tel Aviv. Uh, a lot of interesting programs as well. Like I said, some of that's featured here as talks or some of it's featured at tables outside, like the Source CS guys. Um, then we have, uh, we did some lightning talks inside the office uh, where we had a competition and people voted for the best lightning talks. And then whoever did the best lightning talks uh, got to win a slot at DevConf. Uh, and so these two speakers, um, the one on the left was a, a, a talk about um, for lack of a better term, diversity within uh, computer science or within software engineering. And then um, the person on the right was working on a, or is working on, 
a really cool uh, system for uh, analyzing your basketball shot and how you can actually, if you can look at how you are shaped doing your basketball shot versus how a pro player does their basketball shot. And if you can look at those two models, maybe if you make them more similar, uh, you'd be a better basketball player. Um, so as I said before, all the snacks, like, like all the snacks, all the snacks. Um, and then, uh, you know, it, it, it's been really, it's been really a lot of fun. I've been a lot of involved in, in some of these projects. Um, and I got to stop moving my arm around, screwing up the sound. Um, but so this is our uh, Boston office and, and featuring some of those students. Um, and this is actually a particularly, uh, are these students from this program? The, the all for all high school program? No, right? Oh. Yeah, okay, okay, sorry. So this is our people teaching a, an external program of high school students, um, which are the, the people sitting here in the chairs over here. That's why I was confused, because I was like, no, those are, those are not high school students, I know for sure. Um, as you can tell, I may not have put all of these slides together myself. All right, and that was it. Um, so round of applause for all those people. Uh, extra thanks to uh, Heidi for uh, actually putting these slides together for me. Um, and, and remembering all of the different programs we've been involved with. Yes, I, I, was, I was afraid. Do, are there any here? All right, so let's bring our interns up on stage. You know who you are. We know who you are. Oh, all right. Here, we got a lot. Okay, sorry. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Anybody we're missing? Oh, well, right. Uh, okay. So, what did you work on this summer? Okay. So, I was an interaction design intern in the user experience team at Red Hat. And I worked a lot on the business automation platform, which is under the middleware portfolio. And I worked a lot on Patternfly, which is our design system. So, I don't know if any of you went to talks on that, but there were a few. And we have a booth outside for the UXD team if you guys want to participate in some user research that we've been working on. And yeah. Very nice. Uh, Patternfly is a very handy set of uh, you know, things for web development when you are a back-end software engineer and can't do anything related to graphics at all. Uh, it's really, really useful. So I highly recommend it. Uh, I worked in DevOps uh, with the release engineering team of Red Hat in the Westford office, and uh, I helped write and maintain tooling to help ship uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Nice. Cool. Hi, my name is Shania. I am in the engineering team, but I am a UI design intern. I work on the Chris project for image processing, and I create mockups using Patternfly. Hi, guys. I'm Shruti. Uh, I'm an SRE intern. I worked on the AWS auditing um, that would help Red Hat analyze cost effectively. Hi everyone, I'm also Shruti. Um, I worked uh, with the AI COE uh, as a data science intern um, on a project thought. There were a couple of presentations yesterday, so it's an AI recommendation system for software stacks. Hi, I'm Gabriella. Um, I work on the Ceph team, and Ceph is a distributed um, object file and block storage system. Um, and I work on a specific tool called Ceph Medic, where we run them run the tool against Ceph clusters, and uh, it helps diagnose any issues with the clusters. Hi, everyone. I'm Akanksha, and I'm working with AI Center of Excellence as a data scientist. So I've been analyzing the executive briefing center data for the first half of my internship. And for the second half, I've been working on a project that allows us to convert the blue gene slash video data to text so that it's easier to perform analysis. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you all. All right, round of applause. I was trying to avoid any feedback. Um, and thanks so much for all your help. And I also want to thank especially some of these interns for how much they've been helping with DevConf. So another round of applause. Thank you.
although we will thank them more formally a little later. Um, but thanks. All right, one other one I uh, almost forgot to thank was um, Beverly, who uh, is, I don't think, here, but she also helped put these slides together. Uh, and so thanks to her. Oh, and her name is right there. Um, I thought it was only in my notes. Um, so we are done with that portion of the show, and now we are going to try to move on to um, voting for lightning talks. So I have never used this software before, so I'm hoping it's going to work out well. Um, but here we have the options. Um, and so what you can do is if you go to um, sli.do, and then basically it's going to prompt you for like the key or whatever, and that's pound devconf-2019. And then you can vote on each of these. Um, many of you are very technical. Please try not to hack the system. Um, and so the first one is um, pulp three, and basically being able, or uh, the argument is to stop using rsync to uh, mirror Apple. Next one, open source at Red Hat, the story of Foreman Ansible modules. Um, an AWS audit with OpenShift dedicated. Uh, cost saving using spot instances on AWS clusters. Fun with statistics. Women in open source. How real is AI? And then I don't know how to say this word, Thoth? Toth? I, I really don't know. I've seen it written far too many times. And then how to recommend the best possible libs for your app. This isn't supposed to be showing the results. Uh, I see it. Now I lost my mouse and we're totally in trouble. <laughs> and it still shows the same thing. All right, I'm taking it away. All right, let's do those votes. All right, raise your hand if you're done voting. All right, is there, is there a question back there in the audience? It's pound devconf-2019. All right, again, who's voted? Quickly now, quickly. No pressure. It'll be fine. All right. Wait. I think we're going to start with how real is AI? Um, and come on up. But did you send me your slides, or do you have slides? Yeah, just send me whatever. Or you can bring your laptop if you want. Like I said, this isn't going to be awkward at all. It's going to go perfectly. I promise. Do you want to use your computer?
Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Akanksha Duggal, and I'm working with AI Center of Excellence. And I'm a data scientist slash data engineer. And uh, all this summer, I've been working on analysis of the Executive Briefing Center, which is in the Boston office. We bring all our customers in there, tell them about what kind of technology we have to offer, what are the solutions that can make their work easier as well. So recently, we have built a huge Executive Briefing Center for our customers. We can have multiple meetings at the same time, and that allows us to gather a whole new set of customers. So um, when you talk about uh, having customers, it is really important to know what your customers feel about you. And that's what our team has been working on. We've been working on sentiment analysis and what are the topics that we discuss over time. So we use two main machine learning models that are sentiment analysis and topic modeling for this purpose. And besides this, all of us here have a lot of meetings. So usually at Red Hat, we have blue jeans meetings. So we are trying to come up with something that allows us to convert the video into text so that we can perform analysis. Because you know all of us usually perform analysis on text. It's harder to perform analysis on any sort of speech. So that's like the end goal of this project. So I'm going to touch upon how real is artificial intelligence in terms of speech recognition. As a child, we all possessed an innate ability to learn any language using general skills. There is no genetic code involved in learning a language. We all have the capacity to make sounds, but our genetics allow us to make, uh, you know, make uh, transitions from these sounds to actions, to ideas. So having said that, we will talk about how we will make a machine learn a particular language. So a lot of years have gone into um, converting our knowledge into coming up, from, coming up with a model that allows us to recognize the speech. So I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is a simulation of human intelligence processes by machines. These involve learning, that is grasping of information, and the ability to understand the information, the reasoning, that is the establishing logic and relationships in order to come up with a solution. Self-analysis and correction, just as we humans look back and do not repeat the same set of mistakes, that's what we feed in our machine to not make the same mistakes again. Having said that, we will come up with a model that allows us to convert the speech into text. So how machine learning works is, first of all, we have a data set which has the correct set of information. So we will have a file that contains speaker ID. So, so 10 people are sitting here. We'll each have one ID and an audio recorded by each one of us. And then there will be a transcript. This way, the machine will know who is speaking and what that person is speaking. Again and again, when we train the machine on the same text, we, the machine will get the heck off what this looks like. Once it hears the same word again, it will recognize how this word is written in textual form. And since it knows how each speaker uniquely speaks, it will be able to find out who is speaking. So we use a model, which is an extension of DeepSpeech 2 that is developed by TensorFlow Google. We tweak it a little according to our needs. So it, all, it has two convolutional layers, five bidirectional RNN layers, and a fully connected layer. We use linear spectrogram that extracts the audio uh, input. And we use the connectionist temporal classification as the loss function. So the aim here is to minimize the loss and come up with a transcript that is as good as the speech that we are saying. So I have a small demo. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry.
so before this i'm going to make you listen to an audio very very quickly hello so i'm going to make you guys listen to an audio very quickly so that uh, we know what our machine is going to do You guys can hear it. Can you? Oh my god. Is there a way we can make everyone hear it? Um, is it playing from the speaker? Yes. Okay, so can I have a volunteer, please? Anyone? Okay, yes. So if you can uh, tell people what it looks like to you. Play through. She has the duck to greasy wash water all year. She has your duck suit and greasy wash water all year. What is it? What does it look like to you? Sound like I mean yes. She has your duck suit and greasy wash water all year. Okay, so I'm gonna run my program on this and let's see what my machine translates this into. Meanwhile, I'll still play it for you guys. She had your duck suit and greasy wash water all year. She had your duck suit and greasy wash water all year. Oh no. Can you guys see it? So my machine has translated it into she had your dark suit in greasy wash water all year. So if we give the machine correct data set and information to learn from, it is as good as a human and that is how real AI is. Thank you. Is that better? Yes. All right, let's see who our next winner is. Well, it looks like the pulp guys have it for the next round. So, all right, come on up. Do you want to send me slides or do you want to try to run them? Have any sound? Um, what you do not have sound in the presentation.
Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, for a quick introduction, uh, my name is Mike DiPaolo. I've been a sysadmin for years, ever since age 15, and I recently became a software engineer. Uh, my name's David. Uh, I've been with Red Hat as a, a software engineer for about uh, five or six years now. Okay, so our, my talk is titled Pulp 3, and it's condescendingly subtitled Stop Using Rsync to Mirror Apple. So wh why would a sysadmin want to mirror a, a package repo, RPM in particular? So because, uh, you know, say you have a, say you have a data center where you have a thousand servers running an application. Um, to deploy that server plus the application, you need to deploy all the RPM packages, probably something like a thousand per server. And you need to deploy all your, if your application is in Python, you deploy all these Python packages from, say, Py, Py, Py PI. Um, you probably have configuration and management code, too, and Ansible, and that's also a bunch of roles and collections, too. Um, so you would probably, Rather than have all 1,000 servers reach out over the internet and download gigabytes worth of data, you'd want to have a mirror of these package repos on site. Uh, one reason is just to, to affect, so they can all download it more quickly and save your overall bandwidth. Another reason is so that if the internet does go down, you can still provision your systems and manage them. And many, some customers, too, have other completely air-gapped, physically isolated networks or some sort of semi-isolated network band firewalls they don't want to talk to the internet. So the you would think that, especially as a system and who is familiar with writing bash scripts, the easiest solution would just be to call rsync. rsync is a very flexible and very good at its job utility to mirror uh, folders and files from one system to another or across the same system. Exact, just copies, replicas. Reposync is similarly kind of like that, but understands RPMs a little bit more. And you. And, and, you would, you know, the re and once you have it mirrored, you'd just throw it up on a web server so that all of your YUM clients uh, would, instead of accessing HTTP colon slash slash Fedora mirror list, would access uh, uh, your, your mirror server on your, on your own LAN. So at first, this seems pretty simple. You might think your script would only be like, say, 20 lines of code. <laughs> And before I, but one, before I begin going into the complications, this, I, I'm not picking on Apple specifically. It has problems that many other repos have for mirroring. Similar to CentOS or RHEL, there's over 10,000 binary RPM packages. Uh, CentOS slash RHEL plus Apple are together about 50 gigabytes. But unlike those uh, uh, CentOS or RHEL, it does not keep old versions of the same package. So for example, if, you, if, if CentOS launched with uh, uh, Ansible 2.7.0, and it's uh, and it's currently on you know 2.7.2. CentOS would keep 2.7.0, 2.7.1, 2.7.2, but Apple would just have nothing but 2.7.2. Um, so here's how that 20 line of so script starts becoming ballooning in size. First, you're going to realize, oh, I don't want to serve the repo snapshot on the web server until the the synchronization is com is complete. You don't want to have uh, um, so you have to add like verification and checks and moving f folders based on whether the sync is complete or not. Then you start keeping, um, want to keep multiple snapshots of the repo because say your production environment is on the snapshot that's two months old, your testing environment is on the snapshot that's one month old, and dev is on the very latest. So you start having to do even more moving or symlinks for these scripts. And then you, realize, and you also want to keep even older snapshots because you realize that oh, there's a change in behavior that was introduced six months ago. I want to see how it behaved before six months ago. So you may be now keeping like 20 snapshots. You also want to be able to easily access old packages that are removed because Apple, for example, often moves packages if they're not being maintained by maintainers or have security vulnerabilities. Um, and at this point, you know, you have 20 copies of 50 gigabytes worth of uh, repos, so that's now one terabyte of disk usage. Now you want to deduplicate uh, identical uh, content RPMs across multiple versions of the same repo. So you need to start looking at utilities to replace duplicate copies with hard links. And you also, uh, also where some updates will break you, you haven't, or, because, uh, or they have a change in APIs and you need to adapt to the new APIs. So you need to, hold, you need to use the latest snapshot but hold back some packages. So eventually that 20 line of code script is now hundreds or thousands of lines. And every few months or so, you have to make some change to unbreak it. It's, maybe it's not your fault that it was broken to begin with, but it's broken now due to external factors or new use cases. And 
at this point, like Rick and Morty, you've probably burn, you've, you've burning yourself out. It's a, it's a pain in your side. Not the biggest pain in the data center's operations, but it's a, a medium-sized one that interrupts your work. Pulp is a, I'll, I'll let uh, David Davis explain what Pulp is and how this can solve the problem. So Pulp is a software platform. It's for um, uh, managing uh, software packages. Uh, it's not strictly limited to RPM, although I think that was probably the first use case it was designed for. Um, so yeah, it's a content manager. Here are some of the other um, content types that you can see, like Python, Docker, Chef, RubyGems, and so forth. Um, it, it's architecture, it's a, a plugin architecture, so there's a core, and then there's a plugin for every content type. It's open source, so people can develop their own um, plugins if they want to add a content type. Um, and we have several that are maintained by community members. Um, so if you're interested in looking at Pulp, we have a website, and we're also on GitHub. All the code is on GitHub. And it's written in Python. The new version is in Python 3. Um, so, as I mentioned, the new, new version is in Python 3. Um, some of the new uh, features we've added are we have uh, repository versions. So anytime uh, you make a change to a repository, it creates a new version. Um, so you can easily roll back, but also you get easy promotion. So if you have a new version of a repository, uh, you can distribute that and make it accessible to clients in a matter of seconds. Um, also, we have uh, dynamic web APIs in Pulp 3. Um, this was kind of hard in Pulp 2. Um, this allows you to mimic, uh, like, Galaxy, the API. Um, we have improved performance with async I.O. in Pulp 3, in Python 3. And also, we've expanded deferred downloading, which is like, uh, Pulp won't actually fetch the package until a client needs it, um, so it saves resources. And we have API docs that are auto-generated. Um, a few of the improvements under the hood, um, we're using Postgres instead of MongoDB. Uh, the old version uses MongoDB, and it was um, a memory hog and stuff like that. It was hard to manage. Um, we're using RQ, which has a smaller footprint than Celery. Uh, okay. Uh, we have an API. Um, we're not using Simlinks, and there's a lot less code as a result. That's pretty much it. All right, round of applause. Thank you, guys. Apparently, you should go get some Pulp 3. <laughs> All right, we're going to do one more, and then I think we're out of time. Oop, sorry, I thought this was off. Why does it always go to the wrong one for me? All right, I'm just going to find the window. It's a problem with letting other people use your computer. All right. Yeah, it looks like women in open source have the next one. All right, but I don't remember who it was who was actually doing that one. All right, sorry. Did you send me slides? Uh, I'll pull them up. Is it just the one called Lightning Presentation?
again. I'm Gabriella. I'm Shruti. And our lightning talk is on great women in open source. So in a recent GitHub survey, it was found that only 3% of respondents identified as female. So this really showcases a lack of female representation in open source. In our talk, we want to specifically highlight two women, Michelle Baker and Denise Cooper. But before jumping into that, we want to briefly touch upon the history of open source as a whole. So what is open source? So the idea of sharing recipes and something you've done with other people has been around for a long time. But uh, the idea of doing this with software was really introduced in the 1980s. So the free software movement happened in 1985. And this essentially means that software users have the freedom to uh, copy, change up, and redistribute the code. Right? So the open source movement branches off of that. And uh, this is essentially using the community as a resource uh, to collaborate on the code that you do. Um, and a large part of this company is open source. Um, and fun fact, the person who coined the word open source is a prominent, prominent female face in the community, Christine Peterson from the Foresight Institute. So Michelle is the current head of Mozilla and has been since its inception in 1998. And she's also widely regarded as one of the internet's pioneers for bringing open access to people around the world. In 2002, Michelle joined the Open Source Applications Foundation, where she used her position to advocate for open source technology. Uh, this is Denise Cooper. She, is, she has the nickname for, as the open source diva due to her contributions. Uh, she first started at Sun Microsystems and actually quit because Sun wasn't involved in uh, the level of uh, open source that she really wanted. So then they made her uh, chief uh, open source evangelist officer of Sun. And now she's been part of the community for 17 years. Um, she's been known to knit through her meetings. So that's a fun fact about her. So the next generation of women in open source begins with us. And our internship at Red Hat has really been our first experience with open source and even our first experience with or at a tech, uh, tech, tech internship yeah. Yeah. Um, in general. And throughout the summer, we've learned so many new things. It's been a really great experience. And we've learned to use a really uh, huge variety of open source technology. Yeah, and here's just a quick slide through. That's She's working on Ceph, uh, on the Ceph team. I'm working uh, with as a data scientist, so I use quite a lot of Jupyter Hub and open source stuff. Um, let's see. So our advice, moving on, what we've learned. Um, so asking questions and being vocal was something that we really had to practice. So in being women in this community, it's really important to be heard because there's so few of us. Um, and our hope is that this talk will highlight, um, go ahead, sorry, that's you. Oh. <laughs> our hope is that this talk will highlight um, the significant contributions that women have made to the open source community. And um, we also hope to provide some inspiration for other women in the field, despite the, the numbers. That's the end of our talk. And thank you so much for listening. So thing on? Yes. Um, uh, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, but uh, I would like to another round of applause for the presenters who did it, as well as the presenters who suggested that they would. Um, and uh, I hope that was enjoyable. Uh, I, I kind of liked this format. I, maybe we'll do something similar again next year. Um, uh, and it'll be a little less rough. Uh, but I, I wanted to see if we could make it work. Uh, so thanks, everybody. And uh, please enjoy the, we're actually having like a coffee break right now. And then uh, more talks again in approximately 20 minutes. Uh, so thanks a lot. And I hope you guys see some good stuff. And I hope you're a little more awake now. And I'll talk to you again later. <laughs>